So here is the platform in rough that I've given her. And I thought, really, give her what would win. The 70%, not the primary. You see, right now she's running a primary campaign flanked by Senator Sanders of Vermont and only mildly disturbed by James Webb, uh, dismissive of Vice President Biden and casting a wary glance at John Kerry in Switzerland, who is preparing to have an accomplishment to contrast with her accomplishment-free tenure at the Department of State. <laughs> She is, in fact, a dreadful candidate, and she, in fact, had a catastrophic tenure at the Department of State. So if you are a dreadful candidate with difficulty connecting, if people are raising issues, as Karl Rove raised, about her health, if you cannot but run into the age issue as Ronald Reagan ran into it, and you have to confront it squarely, and if you have nothing on which to run, what do you do? I suggest to her a platform that has five large planks, and I won't go through them in detail, I'll just tell you briefly. I think she ought to run a let the people decide campaign. She ought to campaign vigorously against the institution of the Electoral College, proclaiming that it embodies white male privilege from the 18th century, <laughs> which, by the way, was written by white males in the 18th century. Not many people understand the genius of the Electoral College. It is easily lampooned. It is easily run against, and if it has ever gone away with, you'll never see a presidential candidate in Kansas again. And that is why it exists, to make sure that regional concerns are met by national candidates, and that there is a certain equality in location as well as density of population. But Hillary doesn't need that. She needs to sell the American people on the idea that it is unfair that not everyone vote counts as much, and indeed it doesn't. Right now I'm here to tell you how many of you are Californians? You don't matter. <laughs> you don't matter. In this election, Florida, Virginia, Ohio, and Colorado matter. To a lesser extent, New Hampshire and Nevada and maybe Arizona. But really, the first four matter. Florida, Virginia, Ohio, and Colorado. That's who matters. That's where everything will be spent. Now, that's not who gets nominated. The people who necessarily win in those four states aren't going to get nominated by our side because we have a less than ideal system. Again, the rights reforms have made it better. But given that reality, if you run against the Electoral College, it makes a lot of sense, but you don't matter. Secondly, she ought to run against the 22nd Amendment, which, by the way, is a very bad idea. The 22nd Amendment limits presidents to two terms. And as I write in The Queen, if she runs against the 22nd Amendment, she runs in favor of President Obama's return. She runs against George W. Bush with the idea that Bill Clinton would have done a better job in 2000 than George W. Bush did. But she appeals to the Bush lovers. She appeals to the Reaganots. She appeals to everyone who's always felt strongly that their candidate was the best ever. The 22nd Amendment was a reaction to FDR. It was not unprecedented. Other people had run for a third term. Grover Cleveland Alexander tried to run for a third term. Teddy Roosevelt actually tried to run for what would have been the equivalent of a third term. But FDR actually did it, and he succeeded because he was the necessary man in 1940 and in 1944. But the Republicans didn't like that, and their reflexive knee-jerk reaction was the 22nd Amendment as soon as they could push it through. It's a very bad idea. She ought to run on that. She ought to run on letting the people decide. One man, one vote against the Electoral College and to do away with term limits, which might be very bad for us if an election comes along. If you think about it, what if we'd been in the middle of a presidential election when 9-11 happened? How badly that would have distorted the outcome, how terrible it would have been for the country to have to campaign in that middle, or how you would not have wanted to change horses in midstream at that point if you had been forced to, to do so. The third plank I talk about is rebuilding our national defense. There used to be something called Scoop Jackson Democrats. I'm sure a few of you are old enough in this audience to remember Scoop Jackson. He ran for president in 1976, the first campaign that I was ever involved in. He was a strong defense Democrat. He authored the Jackson Amendment, which brought the Soviet Jews a measure of relief and freedom. And he was often called the senator from Boeing because he believed strongly in buying everything that could fly and bomb, and I was with him on that. And Scoop Jackson lives on. The Reagan Democrats were the Scoop Jackson Democrats who grew disenchanted with Jimmy Carter in 1978, 1977, and 1979, and they came into our party. And my book, The Queen, 
<coughs> which you can, of course, buy at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and Books A Million, says that she ought to run seriously on a platform of rebuilding. As Jimmy Carter did in 1980, I'm sure General Spies will remember the turnaround that occurred in 1979 to 1980. It was led by uh, then Secretary of Defense uh, Harold Brown, uh, encouraged by Jimmy Carter. That is not happening right now, although Ash uh, Carter is a terrific Secretary of Defense, I think, and uh, Bob Work, who's a friend of General Spies, terrific undersecretary. There are terrific people out there. By the way, I went to the retirement ceremony of General Spies. It was great. There were people like me, and there was the Speaker of the Assembly of California. There were Democrats and Republicans at the retirement of a warrior in service of his country. Wouldn't it be great if everyone supported the Department of Defense in that fashion again? So that we would not be... We would not be trending towards 2.5% GDP spending, but up to 5%. And the third platform, I think, plank that I suggest to her is that she run on a 5% plank. Good times and bad times, we're going to spend 5% of GDP on our nation's military. And we're going to buy ships that we don't need and airplanes that we don't need and bombs will never drop just so that we don't have to. And we'll keep the Marine Corps at 200,000 and we'll have special forces second to none, which we already do. But we'll spend the money because, as Ronald Reagan said, prepare for war and it will not come. Don't, and it will. 